brothers and sisters, I beg you, in light of all he's done for us, to offer yourselves in worship to our God. Sisters, I ask you, present yourselves a living sacrifice, a holy and acceptable to our God. Jesus, we've come to worship you. Jesus, we've come to sacrifice Spirit we ask you to fill us to come in and change us and move us to carry our mortal to worship to the divine Jesus we've come to worship you beautiful September day. As you uh, remember, we stay seated during our announcements in the service so that Oscar can film this and not show everybody our backsides, right? So, um, our wonderful praise band, uh, do we have any announcements? All right, children. Let us continue then with our prelude, More Love, More Power. We're actually the praise duo today. So. Yeah. Sarah had to go to a wedding near Chicago. Not her own. So, more Love, More Power.
you would join me for the call to worship. Beloved, the word of wisdom calls us from the street corner, the grocery store aisle, the noisy dinner table, and the quiet places of our hearts. Will you listen? Yes, yes with God's help, we will listen. Wisdom calls to us with hard truths showing us where we've strayed in our hearts and as a community and urging us back into God's path. Will you follow? Yes, with God's help, we will follow. Wisdom calls persist through the twist and turns, the rough patches, the barely discernible paths forward and moments we feel completely lost. Will you hold on to wisdom wherever she takes you? Yes, with God's help, we will hold on to wisdom. Then, beloved, let us worship God together as we cling to the wisdom on our journey along the path of salvation paved with God's love. Yes, let us worship God together. Amen. That's a powerful call to worship, isn't it? Do we have any requests for prayers of concerns or celebrations? I know the McGraws have had a happy time this past couple weeks. Yes. And they have another one coming. All right. And they are a very young are both of you uh, the Magic 90? As my mother said to her sister, welcome to the 90s. <laughs> Other concerns or celebrations? Okay. Yes, Ed. I'd like to pray that we can build up our choir and our music. Program. All right. Ed needs more songbirds in his choir. Yes. yes. So if you, Ernie? All right, Anthony Smith, David Smith's son. David is a well-known community member and helps us out when we bang and ding our cars up. <laughs> Others? All right. Then let us pray together our opening prayer. We long for wisdom, O Lord but prefer that it be our own. We turn away from the ideas of others and ignore the possibility and promises that come from life together with you. Most of all, we drowned out your gift of wisdom as she seeks to get our attention, for we believe we know better or would prefer to decide where we make her welcome. Forgive us, loving God, 
Bring an end to the self-righteousness that ignores you and awakens us anew to the wisdom that comes only from you. Show us how to walk in your ways and listen to your promise each and every day. Join us now as we sing Where He Leads Me. And now we will have our tithes and offerings, if you please.
bow your heads. God, we bring these offerings with hearts attuned to your call. As we gather in your presence, may our gifts reflect the wisdom and discernment you desire for us. Use these offerings to nurture understanding, compassion, and justice in our world. Guide us to listen and to act with insight, spreading your love and grace. Transform our giving into actions that make a difference. Help us to grow in our faith and our commitment to your ways. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You're up, Pastor. Sound like they're going to throw apples at me, doesn't it? Good morning, church. like to share something with you before we start. There is a very lucky woman in this church today. And uh, the one I'm talking about is celebrating a 25th wedding anniversary. And the reason she is... Uh, Lucky is because she's married to me. <laughs> I have to tell you our wedding story. You all are finding out that I'm probably just a little off the wall a little bit. Zondra and I had uh, dated for quite some while. And I have a daughter and her son. She has a daughter. And at that age, they were all into everything and, you know, all these things. So I popped the question. Luckily, she said yes. However, we could not find time to have a wedding. So... <clears throat> we had a surprise wedding. She did not know she was getting married that evening. <laughs> I knew she was in Bible study. As for, it was before I was in ministry. I knew she was in Bible study. I knew what time that was going to be over. So, and I also knew that she had a pair of shorts on and a t-shirt or something. So that's what I had, and I showed up at the end of Bible study. And she gives me that look, because I came in right when it was over. She gave me the look, and I've seen that look so many times before. And she said, what, why are you here? And I said, let's get married tonight. The pastor was already there. He had shorts on it, so we're all ready to go. So anyway... Thankfully, with an answered prayer, she said yes. So we went upstairs to the sanctuary, her and I and the pastor, her daughter, and we were there uh, doing our vows in the sanctuary of the church. It didn't take very long to this side door opens up. And this side door comes there's a gentleman that was, his name was Clarence Leitner. Clarence was 310 years old. He was coming in to make sure that the lights were turned off in the sanctuary. The pastor says, Clarence, you'll have to excuse us. We're taking care of business here. Oh, and Clarence says, oh, okay. So he came and stood right beside Zondra, so he was her maid of honor. <laughs> so then 
we get married, and I go home with her and her daughter. When we get to her home, she starts washing dishes, and I help her daughter with her math homework. Thank you for the wild ride, baby. <laughs> She has always wanted a wedding, and I refuse because after living with me 25 years today, I'm afraid she would not say yes again. <laughs> Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever wondered... Why did Jesus live on the earth for as long as he did? 33 years. Couldn't his life been much shorter on the, in this world? Why did he not step out of the world just long enough to die for our sins and then leave and go back? Tough, tough questions, aren't they? Why didn't he wait a week just be in this world a week or maybe a year? Why did he have to live our life? To take on our sins is one thing, but to take on our aches and pain and sore throats as well? He's taken all that on. Even, even to experience death. He put up with life in this world. He put up the long roads, long days, short tempers. And the question comes around, why did he do that? He did not have to do that. But let me tell you why I believe it is. Because he wants you and I to trust him. Even his final act on earth was intended to win your trust. In John 19, verses 28 to 30, it reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it in his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That is the final act of Jesus Christ's life. His lips cracked, his mouth like cotton. His throat was so dry he couldn't swallow. His voice was so hoarse he could not speak. Jesus is thirsty. To understand the last time the scriptures say that liquid touched his lips, we must look back a dozen or so hours to the upper room. Jesus now has been beaten, spit on, bruised, cut, mocked, and even laughed at. Why doesn't he do something about it? Couldn't he have done something about it? He caused jugs of water to become wine. He made a, a wall of the Jordan River and two walls out of the Red Sea. With one word, he calmed the waves. Psalm 107 reads, He turned a desert into pools of water, a parched land into the spring of water. Psalm 114 reads, Who took the rock into the pool of water, the flint into the spring of water. So why does he endure thirst on the cross? He didn't have to do that, did he? Let me ask some other questions. Why did he grow tired in Samaria? He's God. Why was he disturbed in Nazareth, as it says in Mark 6? Why was he angry in the temple in John 2? 
Why was he sleeping in the boat in the Sea of Galilee in Mark 4? Why? Why was he sad at the tomb of Lazarus? As it's written in John 11. Why? Why was he hungry in the wilderness? According to Matthew chapter 4. And why? Oh, why did he grow thirsty on that cross? He didn't have to suffer. He didn't have to suffer thirst as well, did he? He refused an offered drink before his time, Mark 15 says. Mark says it was mixed with myrrh. Matthew describes it as wine mixed with gall. Both myrrh and gall contain sedative properties that none the senses, but Jesus refused them. He wanted to feel the full force of his suffering. And why is that? Because he knew you and I, he knew you and I would feel them too. He knew you would be tired disturbed and even angry in times. He knew that you would be sleepy, grief-stricken, and he knew that you would be hungry at times. He knew you would face pain, if not the pain of the body, but also the pain of the soul, that pain that is oftentimes too sharp for drugs. And because Jesus understands, because Jesus understands we can come to him with anything. Whatever you're going through, you can come to Jesus because he's been there. He understands and he can relate to what you're going through. John I'm sorry, James 1.5 says he responds generously to all without finding fault. How can he do this? In Hebrews 4, it reads, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need in our lives. Why? Why did the throat of Jesus become raw? So we wouldn't know that he understands. So all who would struggle would hear his invitation when Jesus says, you can trust me. Don't we need someone to trust? Don't we need someone to trust who is bigger than we are? Aren't we tired of trusting people on this earth for understanding? Jesus' message, message in his suffering, in his thirst is this. Jesus is telling us, I am that person. You can trust me. When Martin Luther was printing his translation of the Bible in Germany, pieces of the scripture fell to the floor. A young girl picked one up and read it, part of the verse from our Gospels, and this is what it said, For God so loved the world that he gave, and everything else was missing. The rest of the sentence was missing, but nonetheless, that was a defining moment for this young girl as the tr truth gripped her and began to shine through her. You see, she had been told so often that God was a judge and one to be dreaded. She had been living in the darkness, in the darkness of fear and meaningless of her young life. She ran home with excitement in her heart, passing the note to her mother and talking endlessly about this wonderful discovery. Her mother read the piece of scripture, became perplexed, 
ask her daughter, what did he give? And the little girl lost for a moment with a puzzled description. She did not know the answer to that. But suddenly, but suddenly a thought came to her and her face lit up again as she said, I don't know, but if he loved us well enough to give us everything, we need not be afraid of him. Have you ever noticed while reading the Gospel of John how the author of the Gospel refers himself? He doesn't call himself by name, or maybe in a sense he does. He calls him the disciple whom Jesus loved. But we know that his given name was John, (coughs) the son of Zebedee. He's the same guy who wrote the epistles of John (coughs) and also most likely the book of Revelation. But he doesn't call himself John. He calls himself by another name, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Did Jesus love this disciple more than the others? It doesn't appear that John felt that way. For instance, John tells about how Jesus loved Mary and Martha. He tells us how Jesus even wept over the death of his friend Lazarus. So what made John feel so special? Could it be that after having a hard life-changing encounter with the Son of God, after having experienced on the first hand the forgiving and accepting love of Christ, after having traveled with him so long, after having watched him die on the cross at Calvary and having seen him after he had been raised from the dead, that John's life has been changed so dramatically. His identity has been so ever marked with the love of Christ and there is no other name by which we can think of to express who he is. And that's how personal the love of Christ is for you and for me. It is that way for all of us. Every one of us can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Each and every one of us. Everyone in this town. Anyone in this state. Anyone in this world. Everyone can have such a personal relationship with God. If we choose to accept God's outstretched hand of love and and friendship, we should be able to refer ourselves as the disciple who Jesus loves. Can we do that? It is that precious of a condition which we find it. Everything else is secondary. It empowers us and gives us the sense of meaning and worth. It is the pearl of great price for which we would all give to have it. Indeed, there is so little in the places we look. Think about how much of your life has been spent looking for that kind of love in this world. The young son of a very committed Christian father the son became very ill. As the boy had undergone an exhaustive series of tests, the father was told the shocking news that his son had a terminal illness. After earnestly seeking the direction of the Holy Spirit, he went with a heavy heart to the hospital to his son's bedside. First, he read a passage of Scripture And he had a time of prayer with his dear son. And then gently he told him that the doctors could promise him only a few more days to live. The dad looked at the son and he said, Are you afraid to meet Jesus, my son? Blinking away the tears, the little fellow bravely said, Not if he's like you, Dad. The Bible tells us that when we choose to believe in Jesus Christ 
as Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit that makes us children of God. And by the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father, which is the expression of a very close relationship with God. It is like calling God Daddy. The author of the book of John, the son of Zebedee, a humble follower of Christ from the earliest days of his ministry, one of the apostles who gives us the eyewitness testimony of the life and words of Jesus, had been so changed by the ultimate love of God that he could not find no better way to refer to himself than to call himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And certainly, 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 there's a drastic contrast between the gloomy predicament of human life lived without Christ and the precious glorious of life in Christ, healing perfection that gives to us. It's the difference between living life in the darkness and living in the light. Do we know, do we know that we are people whom Jesus loves? Do you know that? Do we believe that? Have we received God's eternal life? Eternal life is on one hand life after death and in the presence of God. But on the other hand, eternal life is life lived in the presence of God in the here and now. Eternal life is an ongoing relationship with God and in and through it, belief in Jesus Christ who himself brings the life of God into our lives today and forever. Let me share this with you this morning. There is nothing, there is nothing to fear when it comes to Christ. God loves us enough to give us his kingdom through the death of his son Jesus. However, the choice is ours. And the question today is, will we trust God? Will we trust him enough to accept his son? Will we live by the truth and come into the light? This all started, this writing all started just of thoughts of my relationship with Jesus. It was written, I don't know, a couple, three years ago. And I ran across it a few weeks ago. I've added to it. But this, the scripture I just shared with you and what I've just shared with you today is something that is very dear to my heart. Without a doubt, I understand and know the love of God. In my life, I have made some huge mistakes. In my life, I've made some nasty mistakes. In my life, there has been turmoil. In my life, there has been love. I was raised by wonderful parents, wonderful parents. But somehow, some way, we just get caught up in the world sometimes, don't we? And I assure you that in that world is not a place to be without Jesus. But over time, and over many years, I finally heard, I finally heard that small, still voice of God and come to find out that God was trying to get my attention for years. when I got to a point that there was nowhere else to go. When there was nowhere else to go, I gave everything to Christ. And during that time is a time when I met this most wonderful girl that was a Christian. I became a born-again believer in Christ Jesus and was on fire for Christ. Through the years, through the years, we have moved 
many times because my yes to God was send me where you will. Be careful saying that one. But I want you to know this. Every time, beginning with the first time, Zonder and I were married and she had an inkling that I was being called into ministry and I was going through all the hoops and hurdles and all that stuff. Finally got a co phone call from the district superintendent and offered me a full-time appointment and I said yes. So Zondra comes home from, from work and I told Zandra, I said, we need to get some boxes. And she said, what do we need boxes for? And I said, we're moving. And she said, where are we moving to? And I said, Enterprise. And she said, where's Enterprise? <laughs> I told her, it was just outside Shinston, West Virginia. And you know what this God-fearing woman said? Okay. After being there about eight or nine years, I got a phone call and offered an appointment to Clarksburg. Zondra comes home from work. I said, we're going to need some boxes. And the look came on her face. She said, where are we going? And I said, Clarksburg. You know what this wonderful woman said? Okay. After being in Clarksburg about four or five years or six years, we get a phone call. In that phone call, I was offered an appointment into Weston, West Virginia. Zondra comes home and I said, I think we need to get some boxes. She goes, why? And I said, we're moving. And she said, where to this time? I said, Weston, West Virginia. And you know what my amazing wife said? Okay. And then last year, got a phone call. And here we are. But I tell you that to tell you this. God is calling every person in this world to himself. God is calling every person because God wants a relationship with every one of us in here and out there. If you would, please, is to turn in your hymnals to page 12. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We the Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always, everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new spirit, a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night that Christ was taken, he took bread, gave thanks to it and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So this, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. If I could have the ushers, please.
Christ invites all of you to his table. Please come.
go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the church comes together and says, Amen, Amen, Amen. Have a great week in Christ Jesus. go to how great is our God. We've amended the program for you. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God now? How great is our Good week, everybody.